first thing is seabed leasing, okay? Um, and this is where the government, who tends to control the seabed, issues the site to a private company to develop uh, an offshore wind project on that site. And what we've seen a tendency towards in some countries, even countries like the UK, which are the, you know, the, the market leader, is to make that process a, a price-led, hyper-competitive one, pushing really high prices uh, up the way so that people have to pay huge amounts of money just to get a site. And the reason why that's a bad idea, it's not because we don't like paying money for sites, it's because what you're actually doing is imposing a lot of cost and risk into a process at the very outset, which eventually translates back into what the consumer has to pay for the electricity. The second thing is permitting. Now, the best permitting processes are the ones where you have a single body managing the whole process, where the process is very transparent from end to end, and where the, the, the parameters and the, the criteria for making decisions is very clear and objective and transparent. Because developers who develop projects will invest literally tens of millions of dollars developing those projects through that process. And so a process which is unpredictable or um, which has you know, subjective criteria can make it very difficult for developers to put that level of commitment in. So what we need is a very objective, uh, time-limited permitting process. The third big issue is grid connection. And there's, there's, there's a couple of aspects to this. Uh, one is about making sure your grid system is intelligently and smartly um, designed so that it can cope with high volumes of renewable energy. So it's a responsive system, well interconnected, you know, with storage integrated on the system, etc. So it can deal with the way in which renewable energy projects provide power. But the other thing very important for offshore wind is that you have some degree of strategic planning in how you make that grid system um, work offshore. And the more strategic planning you can have, the more interconnection you can have, the more anticipatory investment you can have, the better. Because what you can do, instead of having a single connection for each project, which takes time, which costs a lot of money, which implies a lot of you know, issues uh, locally each time a project comes on shore, you create a, a network which has greater resilience, greater redundancy, which maybe has less points to come on shore, which is a lot cheaper to develop, and which can be built ahead of time, so that doesn't become the reason why projects are delayed. The next thing to talk about is route to market. By this, what I mean is how are you selling the power, right? Now, there's various ways in which this can be done. Uh, some countries go for tariffs set by the government. Some go for competitive auctions, a reverse auction to set a price. Some give nothing at all, and it's up to the individual to sell the power on the market. And really, which one's right for you depends on the status of your market. And what is universally true is that every market, as they industrialize, as they bring the technology in, as they create the supply chain, as they create efficiency in the system, needs some level of support at first, quite quickly, quite steadily coming down over time. So the UK, only you know, eight years ago, was paying prices of probably around $200 for uh, electricity from, from offshore wind. As I said, very recently, they've just entered contracts to buy it for $40. So in the UK, an 80% reduction has happened over time, driven by the volume of deployment, economies of scale, the technology, the removal of risk, and also the reduction in the cost of capital, thanks you know, to all of those other factors, as well as some macroeconomic factors. So any country setting out an offshore wind programme should have an expectation of a trajectory coming down the way on cost. Um, that leads on to the next thing, which is about infrastructure. Um, one of the biggest barriers to deployment of a supply chain in offshore wind is infrastructure, because quite simply, the infrastructure required on the quayside, in the harbours, in the, uh, you know, with big vessels, etc., is simply too high for any one company to bear on the back of one or two project opportunities. You really need to take a long-term program approach to be able to do that. So that means you, know, you need to set a high volume in the market, you need to set 
a good long-term trajectory to make people confident that they can make those investments. But also, the more you can support publicly infrastructure, the better it will be when it comes to trying to deploy industry. And that's one of the things that Korea has really spectacularly outperformed on. Because if you go to the industrial areas of Korea, uh, for example, we were down in Ulsan yesterday, looking at the, the port and harbour infrastructure down there, looking at the heavy engineering capability. It is something quite spectacular, and it really puts um, Korea in a great position in terms of growing the industry and capturing um, those benefits. And again, that leads me on to supply chain, which is to say there are enormous supply chain opportunities in offshore wind. A trillion dollars will be spent just to 2030 in offshore wind. That will be spent in the supply chain. That's where that money is going, okay? But I think if you want to do that in a way where you're seeing efficiency and continuous improvement and cost reduction, you have to do it in a way where you're stimulating the right type of supply chain behavior. You're stimulating competitive supply chains, which means any national program on supply chain should be aimed at promoting innovation and skills and intellectual property and technology, not aimed at protecting you know, the, the, the old industries of the past that couldn't be competitive if you didn't impose some kind of protective um, measures for them. If I was to summarise all of that, uh, trying to give some kind of guiding principles for anyone setting out an energy strategy, it would be that what you need is you need to have clarity up front of what your ambitions are. You know, is this about energy security, economic benefit? Is it about decarbonisation? Is it about cost? And it could be about all of those, or it could be about one of those in particular. Be very clear about that up front, because then the industry responds in the right way. And then set all your other processes out in a way that drives you towards that goal. So if you're all about industrial benefit, don't set processes which are all about driving the price to the lowest point because that will defeat your industrial ambitions. So you, know, you have to think very smartly, be very clear. Second thing you have to be is very transparent. Set out long-term transparent processes. These are very long cycle projects. Developing an offshore wind usually survives at least two, maybe three parliaments. So this can't be a politicized thing. It has to be set out in a very long-term uh, national prioritized framework. Third thing is be consistent. Because of that long-term trajectory, because these big industrial decisions are very difficult to make and very difficult to change, changing your objectives, changing the processes, not being consistent, it can be very damaging to the industry. So consistency. And finally, be ambitious. The bigger, the better. The quicker, the better. Not just for the good of the planet, but for the good of your industry. And those really uh, are the hallmarks of, of a, a, a good, um, a, you know, well-thought-out strategy. So clarity, transparency, consistency, and ambition.